Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Wealth Preservation Podcast. We are here doing episode number two with James Crawford, the uh, founder and owner of Venture Leather Company uh, based out of Uganda, Africa. Um, we are super, super excited about this episode. Where we're going to really dive down into the neat uh, nitty gritty of uh, how you started that company, how you got it uh, up and going, the struggles and successes of, of running a company in Africa, and then just, you know, running a company uh, in general. Um, so we're really excited about talking. So welcome, James. Happy to be here. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and always, and as always, we're here with my co-host, Mark Scyther. Mark, how are you doing today? Uh, doing fantastic. Um, you know, we're recording this on a Friday, so, you know, it's always nice to be on a Friday and have the weekend ahead of us. Um, but this episode, I, I am excited uh, to really dive into this because James is doing something that, um, you know, is, is really unique in the sense that, you know, a lot of people focus on nonprofit work and his, uh, his, you know, his education, it, all the knowledge he acquired through books that he read in Barnes & Noble. Go back and listen to our first episode if you can um, to get more on that. Uh, really goes into why he chose to do a for-profit rather than a nonprofit, and how he's actually making a, a significant impact in the community uh, through a for-profit company and, comp- you know, making products that compete on a, on a global scale. So i um, really excited to dive into that. Um, First and foremost, uh, James, how's uh, how's it going? And do you want to give us a quick ninety second uh, ninety second overview of what Venture Leather is and and uh, what you guys are all about? Absolutely. Well, yeah. Thanks, Mark and Josh, for having me. Pleasure to chat about all things Africa and business. So, uh, yeah, ha- happy to sh- share some thoughts yeah. here. Um, yeah. So, so Venture Leather started a f- couple years ago. Um, it's been a kind of a side project for many years as uh, doing anything in Africa doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> doing so you, business doesn't happen overnight. You didn't just go get a, a you, you didn't go get a, a business, uh, you know, a stamp of like, yep, you own this business. And then the next day it was just like oh, product flying off the shelves. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, the history of Africa, they're very happy just to have, you know, non-Africans come yeah. in and like, oh, yeah, come do business. And, Please, yeah. Grow your wealth. Come on. Come on. Easy. Very, very easy. So, yeah, on top of trying to sell stuff in the States <laughs> after spending all my money in Africa. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, so the kind of long and short of venture leather that, um, you know, make quality leather goods, um, working, you know, primarily with, with a factory in, uh, in Uganda. Um, but there's a, a other couple of components that we can get into, too, that I'm involved in. Um, the factory I work with is a shoe factory, um, is a tannery as well. So we've made shipping containers, you know, a couple thousand square feet of leather that we shipped out to India. Um, My business partner in Uganda has Shoe Factor that is selling shoes um, there in Uganda. Um, And then I'm working with him to make leather goods that sell sell here in the States. So we've tried to do as much as we can in Uganda. Um, We actually also do some work uh, with some factories in India um, because, again, making a quality product. Um, something that I'll sell, sell in the States, not the easiest if mm-hmm. you're doing entirely um, out of Uganda, out of Africa. So, um, yeah, it, it's certainly been a journey, a lot of twists and turns. Um, but the, the whole idea is to really to help get manufacturing going um, in, in Uganda, to create jobs, um, create you know, good jobs, which the leather industry will provide. And so that goes hand in hand with like the overall model of venture um, and with the bags that I sell here in the States, 100% of the profit is invested back into businesses there in Uganda. So it's business that helps business, all about wealth creation, all about creating good jobs. Because at the end of the day, you know, if people have good jobs, they can take care of themselves. They can keep their kids in school. They can put a roof over their heads. They can be on that trajectory to help get, you know, Uganda on a good, good footing to empower its people. And, uh, yeah, increase opportunities. Yeah. So that's, and, and we are yeah. super excited to, to dive down into, you know, because you, you unpacked kind of a lot there, such as like, you know, having jobs has a, you know, a, a multiplier effect on so many other areas of people's lives and focusing on that. First, I want to talk about the product a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, of the, you know, for the company, is there a story behind the name Venture Leather? A, a little bit. So, yeah, I came up with the name. I was actually in the initial stages was working with a couple of people in Uganda um, who all had an interest in, in leather. 
Um, basically it didn't work out because I had a bigger vision. They were kind mm-hmm. of doing the tried and true path of, Hey, let's make something that has some craft and, and value really sell the Africa story. And I said, that's great, but that's limiting the potential of what can be done. And if yeah. we're not thinking big, like things aren't going to change. Um, so, but brainstorming, we, we were sitting over a small fire at an Ethiopian restaurant. Um, smoke and hookah have some incredible Ethiopian food, um, not in Jira, which most people know of, but Tibbs, uh, which go Google it. It's fantastic. Comes in on this like cauldron rice, just wonderful. Um, yeah, just spitballing ideas as one does in Uganda late at night. And, uh, and that is often what I do in Uganda when I'm smoking yeah. hookah, you know, over a fireplace. Yeah, that's, that's what one does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'd come up with a number of different names during the day and actually hid venture in there because I always had this idea of like a business that fuels other businesses, which venture capital essentially does. And so, well, venture, you know, kind of has this name, you know, let's throw that in there. So I put that down on like maybe five or six of the list and went through the list and venture kind of really stood out. Um, and, and I liked it too, because it kind of communi- communicated the idea of just venture capital which people know and mm-hmm. and also just know, like venture kind of like leans a little bit with adventure which is you know obviously a lot of that with africa but i knew i didn't want something that was that communicates like africa in the name um a big thing of that because i want the quality to be fantastic and if you think of Africa and the products from it, you don't think quality on the top of your mind. You think kind of novelty. You honestly think inferior quality because you're paying more because it's from Africa. Yeah. And so I wanted, you know, the quality of the product to stand out. And so I wanted a name that really kind of communicated just yeah. quality as, as and, much as it could. And so real quick, can you go into why Africa, why the leather is so good there, right? Because you've mentioned, you know, in our previous episode, you mentioned like, oh, the, the leather was, uh, you know, I saw an opportunity in the leather industry. What is it about the leather in Uganda that, you know, you're like, this is way better than, you know, other places. They have a, they have a niche here. Yeah. So, so there's some just like natural characteristics that really stood out that made leather, I think the most likely area that I would, you know, pursue. Um, the biggest reason, well, a cu- couple reasons. So cattle in Uganda are big. Um, they're Ankoli um, cattle, which are kind of similar to Texas Longhorns. Um, so they're big, their hides are fairly thick. Um, and so, which is good. Like you want a big cow and a thick hide, um, with leather, um, because you typically split the leather. So if it's thicker, you can get, um, more out of it. So there's definitely some advantages there, plentiful cattle and and good cattle for, for leather. Um, second, there's a history in leather making in Uganda. So you have people with expertise, um, who understand leather, understand how to, how to make it. Um, and then another one, I mean, labor's affordable and leather manufacturing is one of the most labor intensive industries there is. So there's potential for to create a lot of jobs if you get things right. Um, and then also leather itself, like is more valuable than cloth or other things that you can you know, make simple like bags or shoes out of. And so with a higher price point, um, one, it's higher quality, but there's also more margin to work with. So if you have a product itself where most of like the cost is in the material, you can work more with the inefficiencies of Africa um, because it's less impactful at the final price point. Um, if you have something that sells like low dollar and like the inefficiencies really add up as far as the overall makeup of the product. Um, and so it was kind of all of those things that kind of came together. And also there's so much you can do with leather. It's cool material. Um, there's a lot of talk about synthetic leathers, vegan leathers, all this stuff. And you just cannot replicate what actual leather can do. Um, and so that's why you really don't see any vegan shoes out there just because of the characteristics of, of leather, which you can't replicate it. it you're like, like you'll you see want, some vegan bags, but yeah. Like yeah. if you want, if you want vegan, vegan shoes, go buy, go buy cloth shoes. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. 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 So James, r- real quick. I mean, how did you wrap your brain into like becoming a leather expert? Like how did that like, you know, did you read a book about it or was it just like, 
you know, how, how did you gain that knowledge, right? Because I, I don't think you were at your dad's house in San Diego, like cobbling together shoes and like, I'm going to go make leather. You know, how yeah. did that, how did that kind of come about? No, not at all. Like, it was more kind of, so I, I started at the point of in Africa is probably the toughest place you could possibly do business. Um, and so how do I make a very tough situation as easy as possible? And so it was really kind of focusing on the sector, on the product that revealed itself as kind of the path of least resistance. And so, yeah, like I sure have a fascination with leather. It's a cool product, but the interest really kind of was what is my best opportunity of success? Um, and so it, it obviously helped that I liked the product, um, but it was really, okay, let me, I see the opportunity. I care about it. Let me try to understand as much as I can. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's how I became a leather. I wouldn't call myself a savant, but I'm certainly more knowledgeable than, than most. <laughs> uh, aspiring. Yeah, so you find yourself, yeah. You find yourself when you go to other places that, that sell leather products, walking in and feeling like, oh, this is total junk or oh, that's not bad or, or how did they do that? I mean, you kind of doing that all the time now? A little bit. I mean, one of the tricky things with leather is like you, uh, people can hide deficient leather in multiple ways. Like if you, I mean, because one of the ways if you don't see the underside like of leather or you don't see a cross section of leather, you're really only judging stuff from like the outer cosmetic. So because, you know, there, there's ways to kind of do it. Um, but yeah, mo most of it's like the price point. If the price point is denotes it's quality leather, there's some things that you can check, but you can feel pretty good about it. Um, okay. If it's if it looks good, but the price point is really low, there's that. Yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> Certainly suspect. The, the, the owner <laughs> isn't just being generous, right? The, the, no. the store, the store yeah. is not just being like, you know what? We want people to have, we want this to have it cheap. Let's just give it to, give yeah. it away cheap. Uh, so, so, you know, I, and I think, um, you know, I think this is also something that people may not think about when, you know, you're, you're developing products and everything. How many products did, what was the design process or, or how many products or designs did you go through before you were finally able to say, Hey, we don't just have good leather. We have something that we can now like turn around and go sell to people who are, you know, consumers are nitpicky. You know, consumers will notice a flaw and they will not buy something on this, you know, that tiny flaw. How many times mm -hmm. did you go through something and be like, okay, now we have something we can sell? Yeah. I mean, I try to keep things a little simple at first, um, you know, because I think the biggest aspects I think of the selling points are the quality of the leather it's from, from Africa. Um, and so I was really looking for kind of more general use items rather than let me compete on fashion, because if I'm doing that. I'm probably going to lose um, both in what I, I can design in our capabilities um, in, in the factories and people we're working with, but then also I, I'm not exactly a fashionista designer. So if I'm putting myself up in those and try to be on the fronting edge of that, that's probably not what's going to, you know, be my, my path to success. So um, in terms of like our best seller, our bare leather tote, um, it really only went through a couple like minor iterations. Like we added a pocket, changed where the logo is, things like that. But we've kind of had that dialed in from the start, but that's a pretty basic standard design standard product. Um, like if your bare leather tote is, you know, one of the most ubiquitous kind of items that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the other things have definitely been hit and miss. Like I, you know, really wanted to get a backpack in, I think about two years ago and it was okay, but it would just sort of miss the mark. And it was also kind of, we're following a trend of those smaller, you know, backpacks that were pretty popular and definitely on the downside of that. So um, I've really tried, I kind of went wider with the products and then it kind of reeled it back in. Um, a little bit as you know that's what you do kind of scatter shot but then hone in on on, on what works did, did you get halfway through a uh, leather uh, fidget spinner before realizing that fad died too like oh man we we're almost going to release the leather fidget spinner <laughs> almost there yeah uh, still on the concept page <laughs> yeah so so how much of the design influence does the team in africa have or, and the, the locals there and how much do you have or do you outsource some of that or do you have you know, kind of what's your design team look like on products? Uh, me and myself and some, some friends, uh, you know, I kind of have some ideas, spitball it, shoot, shoot it around, get some feedback of mainly women that I trust. Um, <laughs> uh, Smart. Yeah. Smart. And, we and I are on that list, I'm sure. We're not on that list of design. Yeah. 
So, and, and then, then I'll shoot it over um, to, cause not all the work is done in, in Uganda. Um, some, we work a little bit with a factory in India, just because in terms of price, quality, hardware, and some of just logistics of it, um, the leather's always coming from Uganda, but some of the manufacturing and finishing we'll have to do in, in India over time. And that's part of the model, model of reinvesting the profit is to do everything out of Uganda. But, you know, I, I'm not going to put a shoddy product out there. Um, and so for some of the items that we want to do, we just have to set it up that way for right now. Um, so as far as the designs, I'll do most of my vetting and feel pretty good about design, um, you know, here, here in the States. Um, and then I'll shoot it out there to, um, the team and they'll usually have some input more from a manufacturing standpoint. You know, we'll talk about the cost, what material to use, um, if a couple simple changes. Um, but generally speaking, if they have um, some feedback or suggestions on the design, they w- one of the challenges in doing stuff out there is that they have a very limited and kind of misguided understanding of the U.S. market. Um, you know, they, they look at things that sell in their local markets and think, OK, let's do that stuff, you know, for, for the U.S. And generally speaking, it, it's a bit of a miss. Um, I'm always open to those suggestions, but generally speaking, I just know this is what I, what I want. Um, so when they have input on on some of the actual like with like manufacturing and how they make the product, and we need to alter things just as far as the manufacturing process, I, I definitely yeah, that that stuff makes sense. But the actual look functionality of, of it, um, yeah, I, I, I put hard nose on on a lot of the suggestions. <laughs> yeah. And I'm super interested in this. So kind of what was that process of like, okay, I'm going to make leather goods and then to get it from there to like your first prototype, what was that kind of process like? And, and you know, some of the struggles and successes that you had in there and the things were like, wow, never saw that coming or that was easier than I thought, or wow, that's a total disaster. You've kind of talked about the hardware a little bit, but what was kind of that, that process? Yeah. So a big challenge uh, in, in short. So one, one of the, the things is that, you know, there's definitely people who are skilled um, and have been doing leather work for a while in Africa, but almost all of it is for the local domestic market. So for things that are a little bit more sophisticated, the level of training that they have just is not adequate um, for the U.S. market. And also there's also this they don't understand the level of detail and the quality that's required to sell in the U.S. market um, because the quality that will pass in, in Uganda um, or, or in Kenya um, is just it's just not on the same level, not even in the same ballpark. Mm-hmm. So there's there's also like a cultural challenge there um, to one to make it, but also like believe like this is the quality that's required to do it. Um, and so that's was part of the kind of constant failing um, in Uganda. Um, my, my partner also has a small factory in Kenya. So we shifted things uh, to Kenya and Mombasa, which I was thinking, hey, Port City, when we blow it up, we're on a port shipping will help us out. But, you know, we, we had some good people. But one of the challenges um, that I had is that my partner also makes shoes for East Africa. And again, the quality that for his shoes is not American, European quality. So we had a couple of workers who were good, but they required wages that were significantly higher than your workers who were making stuff for the African market. And it was actually causing some disruptions. And we kind of went some back and forth with, you know, the owner, like, how is this going to work out? Especially when the volume of my work was pretty low. Um, and so they would be working on my stuff and on stuff made for the African market, but, you know, they wanted wages that, you know, were higher. So basically we had to figure out, okay, what can we do in Uganda? Um, and then also, okay, well, and we just failed a lot doing it entirely out of, um, out of Africa. And so I went on a visit with my partner. Um, he's Ugandan through marriage, but he's born and raised in India. So he's incredibly well connected out there in India. Um, and basically after, I mean, I'm kind of condensing it basically about a year, two years of, of working, not entirely in Africa. Like I'd be in the States working, go back out there every month or two. Um, 
you once I went to India and just went, wow, these guys can do anything that we want. So it, that's kind of where things shifted to where let's do everything that we can in Uganda. Um, we have a model of, you know, investing in, but without me raising a lot of money and getting us to the point we can do it fully out of, you know, Africa, mm -hmm. let's just do what we can in Uganda, you know, do what we can't in India. And then over time, we'll, we'll merge those, those two things together. So it, it really required me then going to India after failing in Africa to really kind of come out with, okay, now I got a product line, the quality is fantastic and we can go. So is the goal at some point to bring all that manufacturing back into Uganda and do it exclusively there if you can at some point? hundred percent, hundred percent. So, you know, the only, so there's one company that makes things entirely out of uh, East Africa um, at any level, as far as exporting to the U S or um, Europe. And that's Kate Spade. But the way Kate Spade did it is that they basically did this kind of, uh, merge kind of social component as long with the business. They had a long-term commitment and they put big money behind it. Um, and they set it up in a way where what they're doing in Rwanda just cannot be replicated by anyone like me, it can only be replicated by a Kate Spade. And what I mean by that is that they're actually importing leather, um, all their hardware from, from China. Everything that they do is imported, all the materials. Um, and then they spent a lot of money training people six months, nine months to a year um, of, of training to get them up to speed to make the quality that they need. So okay. that's, we're talking about I mean, a couple million dollars here. Mm -hmm. and, and also at the end of that, Kate Speed is breaking even on that. So it's, it's awesome what they've been able to do because these are real good jobs. In, in Rwanda, the problem is that they're not setting up the value chain and the industry to expand beyond that factor. Because what they've done is not anything that your average Rwandan, average African rep can replicate. Yeah. Even, even I can't replicate that. So that's what needs to be done. You know, if you're starting from scratch, creating a product fully in Africa, um, and I don't have a couple million dollars just to spend to, to have a business that is, you know, breaking even at the end. And, 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 that, and, and also that the ripple effects to a larger industry don't happen if you do it that way. So I give all the credit in the world to Kate Spade for what they did, but I'm looking to create not just a successful company, but also help develop the entire value chain of it. So yeah. So, and that's obviously like the big vision and, and again, why the model is, Everything, all the profit, you know, we cover our costs, but everything on top of that goes to help get that value chain where it needs to be. And, and that is a great uh, pivot into the second part of, you know, of your business we want to talk about, which is uh, creating that, that uh, ripple effect and that reinvestment in community and all that that entails. Because um, again, you did not go nonprofit, you went for profit, but you're not just, you know, you're not taking the money and putting it in James's pocket. You're taking the money and doing something else with it, right? So, so tell us mm -hmm. a little bit more about how you're investing in the Ugandan uh, communities and and you know making an impact there. Yeah. So w one thing I add before I get into that, which I think is kind of cool, you know, I think you know in the first episode we talked a little bit of just business helps people. Mm -hmm. You know, you give product services to people. Um, you know, but one of the cool things about being in Uganda is that when I tell locals, when I tell Ugandans, I'm there doing business their eyes light up, it, it, which is really interesting because there's a lot of nonprofits in Uganda, a lot of aid charity, again, like fantastic stuff, but they understand that what business can do, like what creating good mm -hmm. jobs can do for them and their community. And it's really interesting just the way that they open up um, because, and, and what I've realized too, is that business is about a mutually beneficial relationship. Like that's true of the business and the customer, that relationship, but also very much as far as, you know, my, myself, an owner, or business partner and the workers where it's, I'm putting work in, you're putting work in. We're all doing work, you know, for something that's bigger than ourselves. And the reason why you got to just light up, like when they see me doing business is that implicitly I'm saying, I believe in you. I believe in Ganda. And 
people are doing nonprofits, they definitely believe in Ugandans, but it's also a one-way street. Like you're getting money and you're giving it. And Ugandans, they're just in receive mode. And so whereas business, you're engaging with that. You're saying like, hey, you have a skill. I'm going to pay for that skill. Let's do something. And so, I mean, that's kind of like the big overarching where I just like, I'm so fired up, you know, to do business there because it's not just like my own desire. It's just like the feedback and their understanding of people in that community where it's like, yes, this is how Uganda moves forward is by people believing in us, and, you know, creating jobs, creating business. Um, and I would agree that I almost think it's the easy way is to give stuff away, right? That's the easy path, right? Mm-hmm. Anybody can do that. It doesn't take a ton of skill to be like, Hey, here's, you know, X, Y, Z product. Here you go. Good. I'm done. But that, that coming together and working and creating something builds that much. It's, it's a much deeper relationship. And I think it, and it has just those other benefits that you're talking about. And, and, and I almost think that mm-hmm. we should have had a psychologist on, uh, you know, this episode too, because that's something that you almost can't quantify is what changes in a person when they have a job versus a, a charity giving them money, right? Like what changes in their routine behaviors? What changes in their view of themselves and how they value themselves? I mean, I think that also kind of is a component that, you know, it's really hard to put a dollar amount on, but when you're employing people and you're taking, you know, you're taking their labor and valuing it and, you know, having them impact, you know, the company, they go out and live different lives. than if they just showed up, got a check and left. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. th- and this core thing is behind all the burnout that you'll see, read about, hear about as far as development workers, missionaries, wherever, where they spent years in these communities, do so much work. They feel like they're so close with these people. But at the end of the day, the people are just kind of like, you just look at me as a poor person. Like, you're here to help me. Like, you don't need yeah. anything from me. And Uganda, these places are so communal. They're so relational. Like, it's all about, you know, we work together. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, yeah, that, and that's like my big pitch of just doing business out there. It's 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 the hardest thing you'll ever do, but it's awesome and it's just so needed out there. So um, James, hop in your soapbox real quick, now, and we're kind of you know, yeah, you, yeah yeah. How do we how do we change that right? How do how do you fix that? Well, how do you fix that problem? I mean, you're obviously crazy passionate about it. So you know how do what what needs to be done? Yeah, I mean, and that kind of goes. I think the role of entrepreneurs pl- play in society. You know, people entrepreneurs kind of expand what we think is possible. And that's kind of where that kind of like the passion kind of deep down in me has kind of got me to keep going is that I want to be kind of the forge, the path to kind of show what's possible, show what's possible as far as making good product in Africa, show what's possible as far as like how business helps people and just like harp on that. Um, And so, yeah, there's definitely some, you know, I think, I talk with my dad and, you know, people are maybe a bit of older generation just because I feel like there's a misunderstanding with millennials. Um, and some of it I understand a little bit, but I think one of the core things is that my generation, we the only America that we know is an America that is the number one superpower in the world. Like we haven't seen, like, I mean, my dad grew up in kind of like thought he might be get drafted to Vietnam. He grew up in the Cold War where, you know, it wasn't clear that the U.S. was going to make it that our system, our, our way of life was going to succeed. Whereas all I know, all my friends know is just prosperity. Um, and so two day shipping, man, all we know is two day shipping from Amazon. Yeah. Well, and that's just it. People take it for granted, you know, th- yeah. you know, yeah. and so we're just used to it. And I think we just assume, you know, well, in the U S we focus on health and education, get a good job. You're good. And it's like, well, let's just go do that in Africa education, health. And it's like, we just assume the jobs are going to be there and time and time again, all the academic literature in the world, just no, that's not exactly how things happen. And one of the things I always bring up is that in the industrial revolution in England, when economic progress first started getting going, GDP started growing, wages were getting better. Education actually went down during that time because People said, well, the jobs are in factories, they're in manufacturing. So why would I go to school to get a job that is not going to help me? You know, the jobs are in manufacturing. Yeah. So school, going to schooling, learning arithmetic, all this stuff, like, no, I'm going to go work now, work with my hands, because that's where the jobs are. And so that's why you saw a level of education actually go down during that initial stage. That doesn't go to say like, 
education's bad and we shouldn't focus on it. It's just, we're missing the bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, I mean, that's a bigger, bigger battle than I think I can fight, but I hope, you know, through business can kind of show the way of it. Um, yeah. and, and I know, Mark, you asked me about kind of, well, how does the reinvesting of profit, how, how's that model kind of work out with venture? Um, you know, I, have alluded a little bit as far as, you know, initially it's going to focus on building out the value chain so we can train workers and do more of our production process in Uganda. Um, but larger than that, you know, one of the cool things with, with leather and working with the products that we do is that there's so many ancillary businesses that exist within the leather ecosystem. So what I mean by that is that when you make leather, um, there's a lot of byproducts that you strip from the hide as you're making the leather. So for instance, there's a gelatin that you can extract to make an incredible like industrial grade, like glue. Um, that industry does not exist in Uganda. So, or, or really in East Africa, all the, the glue, even the glue that we use in Uganda is imported from India. Um, so there, there's an opportunity there to use a byproduct that right now is waste. Like it gets it, dumped like in a landfill or, you know, however, however it's handled. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we can use that what is waste to basically create the infrastructure of a glue industry. Um, and one of the advantages of my partner being from India is that we've met people in India who run glue operations out there. And, you know, we've had talks with them about, hey, what do we need to do to help set this up, you know, in Uganda? And which they're, a lot of them are very interested because a lot of the restrictions and things going on in India, they're looking at Africa more and more as far as shifting some of their operations. Um, you know, we've also done some experiments with chicken feed. Um, because the same people that are supplying us with hides, you know, they have bones of the animal. Um, so we can grind that up um, and create a chicken feed. And so we've already done some trials and have a salesperson going um, in Uganda to try to get some leads with that. So, um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of kind of ancillary businesses that are that we can create jobs and turn what essentially are waste products into good, you know, good jobs, good industries. Um, and so that's essentially the idea of the model is of reinvesting the profit is getting these industry going, but just continually tapping into the network that we have, um, because of the relationships that you acquire along the way. Um, you know, I, I mentioned at one point, I talked just how there's opportunity all over the place, but the ability to execute on it, that's fleeting. And so by doing business already, developing those relationships with other business people and also with, with government, um, if you can put some massive roadblocks in the way, is that we're kind of reducing those those costs to kind of, you know, tap into those opportunities. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's essentially how the model is. You know, I hope one day we extend far beyond what we do and almost become like venture capitalists and um, do, do some things like that. But... Yeah. Well, what are some of those interesting roadblocks that, you know, either culturally or government wise that, that have kind of been thrown up just in and, starting up? And not just roadblocks, yeah. but what was the intention, right? Because usually, you know, it's it's good intentions that, you know, create these roadblocks, right? I, it's never government saying, you know what, I want to crush this industry. They think they're helping mm-hmm. or, or not just governments, but, but communities. Um, you know, what are some of the intentions of why they did things? Then what were the roadblocks you experienced? Yeah. So I think there's two stories that come to mind that I think kind of add so much more depth. So I think with people's understanding of what it's like to do business out there. And so the first one was when we tried to import some products from, um, sorry, excuse me. Uh, the first story is about when we try to import some products from India, they were like some hardware and then also some finished leather that we essentially were going to, you know, assemble in our factory in Uganda. And so me and my partner were um, flying from India to Uganda. And I told him, you need to be the one carrying this like through the airport because there's no way they're going to let me get through without just charging me through the roof, Um, you know, in fees, taxes, you know, tariff, whatever. And so um, my partner, he takes it with, with his luggage. He gets to the customs official in the airport. And I think we had paid maybe $1,200 for everything that we had. She initially wanted to charge him $1,500 for everything that we were going to bring in, which is a non, 
one start. I mean, you're never going to recover the cost at all. Yeah. So what happened was, um, so my partner, he's ethnically, he's Indian. So he doesn't look Ugandan. So immediately he goes, no, I'm a Ugandan citizen. Here's my documentation. Here's my leather. Uh, I'm an established industry. Here's my company registration. Even at, like shows her a card of someone in the ministry of trade that he knows really well. It's like, do you want to talk to him? Like I can call him on the phone. He can vouch for me. Like I'm a Ugandan. This, like we're trying to build these in, in you know, in Uganda. Cause her story was that, well, these look finished enough to where you're just looking to sell these, take your money and go back to India or, or wherever. And so we ended up, rather than paying $1,500 to bring those in, we ended up paying 90. So it's really easy to look at something like that and be like, well, that's corruption. Like she's just trying to extort you for this money. It's like, not really. So what's going on is that she is making a judgment. She's becoming judge and jury of like what to charge, what lies a plot, apply to my business partner bringing in these goods. And so in her mind, she, she's thinking, okay, well, this is a foreign businessman who's just trying to make money from Ugandans and, you know, doesn't really care about the community. And so she, in her mind, she's actually looking out for Uganda's best interests. And so that's why, no, you're, you're, I'm going to charge these as finished goods. But once he established trust, once he established that, like, no, 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 like, I want to do right by Ugandan, like, I am Ugandan, she goes, Oh, okay. So, so then he was able to bring them in as intermediate goods, um, which are, you know, taxed and dealt with completely differently because trust was established. Right. So that goes into the relationships and, and also like, there's no way I could ever convince that customs official that, you know, these are, are what they are, you know, intermediate goods that we're going to make in the factory. Um, so it's just like a non-starter um for a foreigner or someone with white skin to operate on that level like if you're bringing in a million dollars worth of goods you got the money to hey, you know pay the right people or or you know to get the right people to charge you rates so it's kind of you operate on the local level or your big money and right. and i'm definitely not working big money so <laughs> yeah so people look at that as you know africa's corrupt well it's not there's there's Corruption is a lot of areas of gray. Um, And there's a lot of things where it's corruption. You can call it corruption, but it's really about access. You have access to the correct laws. But if you don't establish trust, well, you're not going to be dealt with in a trustworthy manner. And you can disagree that they don't trust you, but hey, you're you're a guest in that country. It is what it is. so, so I think that's that's something that constantly, if you don't have relationships and the right people to kind of fight those battles, you know, it can just be a non-starter. Um, I, I, so the, the second story is um, has to deal with like utilities, so electricity rates, water, water rates, but it's emblematic of how governments are really set up in Africa and and how you work with them. So my uh, the factory that we have, it's it's. A business, you know, mid-sized business has about 70 workers in total. Um, well, the way the rates work for electricity and water is that you essentially get a waiver or signed off paperwork that you are a business at a certain level. And that dictates the rate that you get charged for electricity and water. Well, of course, it expires. And so the, what you need to do is kind of re- get that paperwork issued again. Sounds simple enough. Um, the problem is that the way these ministries are set up is that you have regional offices throughout the country. They are absolutely useless. All the power is consolidated, like in the capital city, like the main, you know, ministry of water, ministry of electricity. And not only that, the power, the ability to kind of sign off these waivers, get the right paperwork is consolidated essentially in the head minister. No one moves a finger unless they say so. So what that means is like, if you don't have access to that minister, if you're not doing big enough business or have the right relationship, you're never going to get an audience with them, which means your business is going to get charged much higher rates for electricity, water, or or anything else that that you need done. And so my business partner has enough, like he doesn't have the, the money to get an audience, but he has enough of relationships, enough of trust, which is part of the reason I wanted to work with him to begin with 
but it's still tooth and nail trying to get an audience and and get the rates that were legally, you know, should be entitled to. Um, and so, you know, without getting that, you're just bleeding, bleeding cash. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's small things here and there. Um, and so it's where well, the law says one thing, but do you have access to, to what the law entitles you to, you know? And so, and that's what is so difficult for smaller businesses, um, you know, in, in Africa getting going is that they don't, they have zero ability to lobby government or get things done because power is consolidated with, you know, these few people. And that's by design. I mean, government wants power. No, <laughs> no. they, they <laughs> love turning it, they love turning it down. Yeah. So, uh, but, but it's, it's just really interesting. Cause I mean, we, you know, local governments are really important in this, in the U S and states rights, all that kind of stuff. And in Africa thing, I mean, Uganda is a democracy, but power is incredibly consolidated in like the executive branch and like the central government, um, local governments, like they, they knock on your door. You don't really care at all because they have no power to do anything, which you feel bad because it's like, well, you like, they actually care about the local area, but like, you know, they have no ability to build roads or do anything because yeah. all the decision-making, all of it comes from the central government. Um, so it's, it, it's tough, but like it, you, you're not going to change it. Like as a business person, you take the, the policy environment, the government situation is granted because if you fight that battle, like you're probably going to lose. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, yeah. Well, so, so that's some of the challenges like of, you have to deal with, with, if you want to do something of, of substance, you have to deal with it. And generally, the, you know, people who've been successful have been able to do it with, you know, big money behind what they've been able to do, which is, I mean, good. Like you're creating some job and doing some industry, but you're not creating the ripple effects that really, you know, help Uganda out, you know, in any big way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you've you've found, you know, hurdles and roadblocks, you know, from from just like a, a government structure standpoint. Right. And just how, how things operate as a country. Uh, can, can you go into maybe some um, you know stories or details of how maybe you've uh, had struggles or roadblocks just from a cultural difference? Because in our first episode, you had mentioned like, oh, it's easy for Americans to go to a place and be like, oh, the reason why you're you know not successful is because you're not doing things the way we do them in America. When realistically, you know, people who live in that country probably know more than the American does, right, in, in some aspect. And so are there maybe some ways that maybe just Africans worked different or viewed the world different that was just kind of a cultural um, uh, hurdle as far as, hey, if we're going to be successful as a company, I need to adapt to you and you need to adapt to me and we got to find some some way to work together. Yeah, I mean, some of the most striking, I think, cultural things happened when I was working for the U.S.-based company um, before I started Venture, um, just because I, I knew if you fight culture, you're, you're going to lose. Yeah. Um, and so I was basically fighting my U.S. you know founders at, at that company just to kind of help, help them understand that you need to merge with the culture that exists rather than trying to change it without them understanding that's what they're in effect doing. So there was a ton of lessons that I learned through that experience that I tried to take with um, when I did venture. And so one of the things that I tried to do was make it very explicit that like, I'm there to do business. Yes, I wanna help people. I care about the workers. I care about the well being and like the things they got going on, but like I am a business person um, because I mean, it always is the case where workers just see ownership as they just got cash out the wazoo um, and always want to get paid more, all that kind of stuff. And me being an American, it definitely, you know, and in, and in many degrees, like they're right. Like I'm getting on a plane, spending a thousand dollars to go out there and do stuff out there, which is more money than they're ever going to see at one time. Um, but and so definitely one of the great things about having a Ugandan owner um, and someone who's Indian too is like, he's kind of like a middleman with the cultural battle. He can fight a lot of those things uh, as far as, you know, work ethic or wages, all that stuff. Like 
I, I really love the words, you know, like it's his company. Like, and I don't at this moment have like actual ownership, um, like in the, co- in the factory in Uganda, um, part of it just because it would be a mess to get legal ownership mm-hmm. of, of at this point. And it also like, it, it's just not a smart move on my end business wise. Like I trust my partner out there and like that that's good enough. Um, so he can fight a lot of those battles. The, the bigger cultural thing I've had with venture is dealing with my Indian, uh, you know, partner, um, because that's a whole other culture. It's a little bit more similar to, to American culture, um, than like Ugandan culture. But one of the most difficult things is that Indians, they, they always want to please you. Like you are their, their guest at all times. So they never want to tell you things that you don't want to hear, which is really tough in business because he's told me things that at ta- at the the first time he tells me it's accurate fairly true but it stops being true you, you know down, down the road and so i'm operating on these assumptions that are not true at all anymore but he doesn't want to let me down and he's a very optimistic person it's going to work out so then we get to decision time and then i find out what's actually going on and just yeah, just throw my hands up. And I think from an American standpoint, it's like, you've been lying to me. But it's just like, but it's like, kind of, but again, it's like an area of gray, just because there is such a cultural thing where like, you don't want to let people, you don't want to let your guests down. Um, so it's that that's as far as venture goes, like that's been a real challenge of kind of getting the right information at all times. Um, and, and I'm yeah. sure it's one of those like, you know, you know, it, it, it is a little different where it's like, well, you've been lying to me. It's like, well, you've been extremely optimistic and trying really hard to fulfill and it just can't be done. Right. I mean, that that's it's not lying for financial gain. It's not lying for deception. It's lying yeah. for like, you know. It's like the, you know, the car salesman. It's like, this thing's definitely going to get 40 miles. You know, like that's, that's not, you know, that's not the same kind of lie. That's someone just trying to push a product. It's someone who's like, Hey, yeah. we're really going to, we're, we're, we're really trying here. Right. And so. Yeah. So I think one, one of those specifics that kind of goes into why, you know, I'm currently employed with Booz Allen here again for my, my third time and turned kind of venture into a side hustle at the moment is that I help my business partner um, raise a little bit of family and friends money to um, finance the sale of leather to a big shoe factory in India. Mm-hmm. Um, today we've sold about five containers worth, which is about 120,000 square feet of leather um, that, that we've sold to India. And, and initially everything looked great on paper, you know, our ability to kind of turn over our cash to sell, we have this, you know, big, client in India that I've met multiple times that has a big shoe factory that, Hey, we can just like build up. It's cash flow positive already. My partner had already sent a couple of containers over to him. Everything looked great, but it was all based on incredibly optimistic projections and also some, a business relationship that I didn't really fully understand between my partner and the, the owner in uh, India um, cause they know they've done business and known each other for probably two decades. And, but there's a lot of kind of power dynamics at play that, you know, we, we've sold, we've sold the leather, um, but the cash hasn't quite come in, um, and, and it's in, you know, in, in its entirety. So that forced my hand a little bit, cause I was going to use that cash to kind of roll over into venture and keep churning and, and keep going. Um, and so still in the process of kind of doing that, but it's essentially the, the owner in, in India, he's looking to move some of his operation to Uganda. But, but when he does that, he wants to be in the position of as much power and leverage as, as possible. And with me being in the picture, helping getting this mother trade going, that kind of equalizes things too. And this guy in India has a big ego. He has a very successful business in India um, but he's the type of person who ha- always has to be the biggest person in the room. Mm-hmm. And so it, it's one of those, where everything looks great on, on paper. Um, we sh- you know, we should be expanding the factory and doing, you know, a couple containers every month, but it's dead in, in the tracks at, at the moment. So 
Um, but again, that that's part part culture, part just you know, business always breaks down by people. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, well, hey, yeah, Frank, yeah, no, that, how can we help? Yeah. Is there any way we can help solve that situation? You need another infusion of capital to start your own shoe factory, or what? Well, I, I mean, I, yeah. So I was actually on the phone with my partner in Uganda, you know, a little bit before this. So we're, we're making moves. I think we'll recover the money. It's more of a time of a question of time rather than if. Yeah. Um, so, but it, the interesting thing about doing business again in Africa is like, I mean, business in general, you always twist and turns, but Africa, that's definitely the case. And, you know, the bag sales have, have been doing okay, but I'm actually quite interested in helping my partner specifically in Uganda. Um, partly because manufacturing is pretty rare out there. Um, one of my big things that I want to do that I want to use the cash from the bag sales to flow into is that I want to help my business partner in Uganda launch a consumer shoe brand there in Uganda. Um, because the novelty of the message of having a Uganda made product doesn't exist. Like people um, in Uganda, they know just manufacturing the opportunity that manufacturing jobs can provide for, you know, the jobs for, for everyone. And so they're really hungry for that message. And I've always already done some trials with some like Facebook ads and, and things like that out there. Um, and we have all the infrastructure set up. Like we've been able to acquire like a small facility in India where we can make shoe uppers. Um, and we can, again, do what we can't do in Uganda and India, bring it to Uganda, assemble it in the factory and sell locally. So, you know, I'm basically working at like all fronts on it. And so, you know, I, I see some real success there. Um, COVID is definitely putting a damper on, on some of those plans. Uh, for for the moment, but there's a lot of paths to success. And as much as I want to get, you know, venture, you know, flying off the shelf, um, growing here, the big thing is to get manufacturing going in Uganda, create jobs out, out there and, you know, create a real industry mm -hmm. yeah. um, there. So, um, yeah, it, and it's it's been interesting because I initially was a little bit hesitant to take a more active role in the factory itself because my business partner in India, like he grew his shoe factory from making five pairs of shoes with three employees to now making, you know, 2000 shoes a month with 70 employees acquiring the machines where he can make, you know, finished leather um, and just, I mean, you, you spending time out there with people who've done business and know, understanding how challenging it is, like really develops a, like a respect for everything that they go through. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I've been hesitant to take a more active role, but over the six, seven years I've built a relationship, you, you know, is really it helped me think about different ways that I can add to what he's already doing and, you know, achieve, you know, the, the growth of that business that ultimately like I want to do and be a part of. Yeah. So, um, uh, yes. And, and, and I mean, how has that really shaped your just philosophy of business in general? Right. Cause now you're getting global experience. You're getting, you know, um, uh, interesting business relationships with, you know, your Ugandan business partner who's from India, who, you know, you've experienced some, some pretty dramatic stuff. How has that just changed your uh, business philosophy or has it from when you first start out with like, Hey, I'm an American, I'm going to go start a business in Africa. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing, and, and I think I mentioned this on the first time when I was talking about how like in sports, you feel like you're naked, mm -hmm. like when you're playing out there, because like you're either good or you're not. I think business and being an entrepreneur has revealed that about myself, like my strengths and weaknesses. And while I feel that I have an intimate knowledge and understanding of how to develop, you know, the value chain and, and do like substantial business out there. I definitely a little bit more, you know, lacking as far as like the marketing, the brand and like mm -hmm. launching a product here in the U S and so that again, kind of, you know, cause right now with draw launching a consumer brand, you got to pay to play the game. Um, and so in the situation I'm, I'm at, yes, I know I could raise the money, but do I feel good about raising money, especially with the money I haven't collected already? Um, with what I've already done and 
you know, just my mentality, that's not the position I, I want to be in, especially when I know that the success of venture and like really growing it to scale hinges on things that really aren't my strength that I know I need to bring in, um, which again would, would require, you know, the, the capital and everything to go do that. And so, yeah, it's really exposed just more about myself and what I'm good at and what I'm not good at, which has been a tough pill to swallow at times, but you have to be honest with yourself. I think every entrepreneur is always in the clouds, you, mm-hmm. you know, with it. And um, yeah, so it's the drive and the passion and pursuing the, you know, the goal of, you know, getting, getting this company really humming um, that, that, that hasn't lessened. Um, but I feel like it's your shortcomings kind of c- come aware, but also mm-hmm. like your strengths and, um, that they also get honed as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think the biggest thing as far as my overall business understanding has really been like me understanding myself as a business person mm-hmm. um, and what I have to offer, what I'm good at and also what I'm not good at. Yeah. Perfect. Well, hey, Mark, you ready to dive into the speed round? Yeah, we'll do, we'll do, uh, we won't go through all of them. We'll just go through a couple of nice short answers. Uh, we're super excited that you came on the show, James. Thank you so much. Everyone go check out ventureleather.com. Uh, uh, super awesome products from Uganda. Uh, and you are going to have, um, you know, you're going to be buying quality products and then that company is going to be reinvesting in the Ugandan community. Um, real quick, uh, um, your favorite, well, actually we covered your favorite uh, leisure time uh, in Africa. Let's go with, uh, you know, you're on Shark Tank, right? You've got Damon, Mark, Robert, Laura, Barbara, and uh, of course, Mr. Wonderful. They all have offers on the table. Who are you working with? I mean, I think it's easy to say Cuban just because, I mean, I love sports and I feel like he's kind of like a guy's guy, but so I've actually watched Shark Tank a lot and actually watched a lot when I was first in Uganda, just because it's like business. I want to, yeah, get in, get in that mindset. But the thing with Mark is that he really understands the value of like products that mean more than just the product itself, that they take on this larger meaning. Like he's invested with companies that are about veterans, about, Mm -hmm. you know, he understands the social component and he understands, I think that there's added value there and that added value doesn't only necessarily need to be a cost. So I think in terms of me trying to establish a brand that encompasses something larger than just the physical product itself, like I think he would understand right away. And I feel like that is kind of like the cornerstone of what I'm trying to create. Um, I think all of them would be awesome, but I feel like I've really noticed that in Mark himself. So Mark Cuban, um, if you're listening, Venture Leather, look at this. Yeah. All right. uh, if you could get a celebrity endorsement to uh, to talk about Venture Leather, who are you getting? Ooh. Um, gosh, that, that is a good one. Man, who could? I mean, let's just go with the big, like, Kanye. I mean, he's got the biggest platform, so. Uh, right? Yeah. I mean, he just ran yeah, for yeah. public office or something. Taylor, Taylor Swift, you know? I don't know. There yeah. you go. So, Taylor, oh, hey, we, we need some Yeezy, we need some Yeezy handbags. Let's no, that, that, that's yeah. actually a bad combination right there. I think they have some bad blood. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, Connie has actually been to Uganda and met the president of Uganda. So, uh, you know, maybe there is hey, a little hey, Uganda. Sure. Hey. Uh, I don't know. Hey, um. So James, tell us how, how can we get a hold of Venture Leather products? Where they go? How do uh, Christmas is coming up? How do they buy the stuff Christmas and, and put it under the Christmas tree? Yeah, ventureleather.com. Um, if any of you are Etsy shoppers, definitely uh, look at Venture Leather on Etsy. Um, and if you want to know anything more about venture, about myself, about doing anything in Africa, whether it's nonprofit, business related, love to chat with you. Um, so yeah, James at ventureleather.com. Um, if you want to Shoot, shoot me a link. Um, but yeah, check out the bags and uh, we, some we will have links to the social medias, the the stores and everything uh, in the description. Everyone go check out uh, VentureLeather.com. Super awesome company. James, thank you so much for being on the show. So, hey, so James, real quick, I'll put you on the spot a little bit. If somebody listens this far into the episode, can, is there any way that we can help hook them up with a bag or do something? Is there anything we can do? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll get you guys a code. What is it? wealth how, how okay. bad as sure. the code wealth. and yeah, yeah we'll give you 20 percent off 25 percent off i don't know we'll, we'll see how yeah. charitable i'm yeah. going in the holiday season there but, we go. yeah i'll you let you guys know and we'll episode. make that happen you want a venture bag use the code wealth and, and we'll hook it up there we go thanks man like awesome it. 
All right. Well, hey, uh, lastly, nothing we say here can be taken as uh, tax, legal, or financial advice. Uh, please um, don't go start a business in Africa just based on this podcast. Go go see counsel. <laughs> Absolutely. I concur. All righty. <laughs> Thank you so much, James. Dude, yeah, awesome. Thanks, guys. This was great. Hey, okay. all right. Awesome. Bye. Later, man.